I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello, hello, hello. Hello in the window. <laughs> Little bit, honey, how are you today? I'm kind of warm today. Why? Oh, I guess it's just one of those July days. Good for the corn, but not for you, huh? Yeah. Do you have a riddle today? I certainly do. Now listen, I can carry a man, but I cannot walk. I have a tongue, yet I cannot talk. Though I have eyes, I cannot see. I wonder what my name can be. Hmm? Oh, I don't know. And it's too warm to think. Just tell me the answer quick. Very well. I'm a pair of shoes. Oh, oh, that's very good. Shoes can't walk by themselves, and, and they have a tongue, and they have eyes. Yes. <laughs> now, would you please read me the funny? Puck the Comic Weekly? Yes. Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on top of the first page is Hop Along Cassidy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for Hop Along. <laughs> Hoppy and Doc Swayze escaped from being burned alive when the ghost raiders tried to kill them by setting Nestor's shack on fire. The sheriff, California and Lucky, join Hoppy in order to capture the ghost raiders. Hoppy has worked out a plan which he has put in operation today. A merciless sun beats down upon a two-man wagon party, slowly crawling across the shimmering desert floor. It's Lucky in California. Lucky says, first picture, second row, well, if Hoppy's right, it was the ghost raiders that tried to kill him and Doc Swayze and Nestor Shack. California replies... Well, 5,000 were toting to El Paso. Ought to be enough bait to lure them out in the open. They approach the water hole where the robberies had occurred before. California says, There's the water hole. Now, don't forget your instructions. Lucky replies, <laughs> Don't worry, I'm just thirsty, not crazy. They pull up beside the water hole, big picture, third row. They rein in. Eagerly, Lucky and California dismount and drop beside the water hole. They only pretend to drink. Then they continue on their way. First picture, fourth row. A dozen miles beyond the water hole, they make camp. And then they bed down under blankets and pretend to fall asleep. In the silence of the night, they wait, tensed and ready. Suddenly, off in the shadows, there's a slight movement. It's two men who slip quietly toward them. It's Brand and Concho, the outlaws. First picture, next row, Brand whispers, Ah, sleeping like babes. That drug water sure did its work. And Concho exclaims, And now we do ours. Hey, look, Brand. The 5,000 they brag about in town. And then the unexpected happens. A tarpaulin is jerked off the wagon. All right, men, get him. And out of it, the sheriff's posse jumps. Concho exclaims, It's a trap! And they run for their horses. After them, there they go, over that little wagon there. Hurry up, get him! First picture, bottom row, Lucky in California, leap to their feet and fire at him. And last picture, Lucky says, Ah, the plan's working. They're doubling back toward Buckskin. Take after him. California and I will shortcut into town to sound the alarm. Me too. And now if Lucky gets back to the town of Buckskin in time, they can head off the outlaws and then they can capture them. Do you think that'll happen next week? The only way to find out is to be here. Oh, I will. Good. Now it's time for Prince Valiant. And he's on page three, I know. So over the page we go, and here he is on page three. You remember uh, poor Arf has been very unhappy because he lost one of his legs, and so Val has been trying to cheer him up. Yes, and when they stopped at a strange port... 
Val tried another plan which he had in mind, and just as he was wondering how it would work out... A beautiful girl came on board the ship, and Val has decided to introduce the beautiful girl to Arf. Yes, he hopes that Arf will fall in love with the girl and forget his troubles. And I hope she will fall in love with him. So do I. Now let's find out how it works out. Here we go with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hecket, Breckett, Grey Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> So despondent is Arf over his shattered dream that Prince Valiant has to tell him that he never would have become a great warrior. Then two passengers board the ship. Val makes haste to introduce himself, for here is someone who could easily make a young man forget his troubles. Val tells the young lady, last picture top row, We have a long journey ahead of us across wintry seas. Uh, perhaps my young squire can help you while away the lonely hours. Big picture, middle of the page, Val leads the young lady, whose name is Adele, to Arf's cabin. And Arf is presented to Fair Adele. And immediately, he becomes tongue-tied. He remembers that his hair is uncombed, his tunic rumpled. Val has commanded that he entertain the girl, so in the course of duty, he reads to her the account of their travels from Thule to Rome. Adele thinks it's splendid. She asks Arf who wrote it. Arf answers modestly, Oh, it's... Well, it's just something I dashed off for the King of Thule. Once again, the ship has gone to sea. And Val's plan seems to be working. In the days he aspired to be a great warrior, Arf had disdained music. But now, still in the course of duty, he finds it a pleasant way to entertain. First picture, bottom row... He serenades the fair Adele, who listens, a soft, dreamy look in her eyes, as their ship sails under the starry skies toward home. A smile comes once again to Val's face before he goes to sleep at night, for he has found a way to make his young squire happy and forget his unfortunate accident. And Val plays the lute as Arf, his evening spent composing ballads for his beautiful young lady works on. We see him dreamily at work, last picture, writing sonnets for the amusement of one small girl. Oh, goody, 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 it's working. Adele is in love with Arf, and Arf is in love with her, and he's happy again. Yes, he is. He looks as happy as any young man could be. Oh. Isn't that wonderful? Ah, oh, it's just wonderful. Oh, I love people who are in love. Yeah, so do I. <sighs> Would you like to read another comic? Oh, yes, please, please. Very well, then. How about Donald Duck? Oh, I just love Donald Duck. All right, turn over the page and go past Snuffy Smith. Go over to the next page. There's Jungle Jim. Turn over that page. And there is Donald Duck at the top of page six. Say the magic words with me, please. Squeeze them, squeeze them, squeeze the chicken check. Let's have music to bed and quack, quack. Donald and his nephew Huey are going out golfing. Donald, who is going to play nine holes of golf, says, I lost six balls the last time I played. If we don't lose any this time, I'll treat you to a movie. Huey replies, Boy, oh boy! I'll keep my eye on the ball. But Donald takes a swing at the ball. And away the ball sails. Away, away, away. And then, out of sight, Huey exclaims second picture. It's in the rough, but I got it spotted. So? They walk out on the rough, which is in the woods and the bushes, off the short grass of the fairway of the golf course. Donald finds the ball, and Huey says, uh, It's hard to get back on the fairway, Uncle Donald. This was a little hard to find. So Donald gives the ball a wallop. <laughs> and away it goes, and lands on the fairway. And 
They trudge after the ball again. Donald settles down and plays a good game. Until finally, fourth picture, first row, Huey says, Only three more holes, Uncle Donald, and we haven't lost a ball yet. Last picture, top row, Donald wallops the ball again. <coughs> and they watch it as it sails away. And disappears in the rough again. And they trudge after it once more. Finally, second picture, bottom row, Huey tells Donald as he hands him the club, The last hole, Uncle Donald, and if you don't lose the ball this time, we've won. Donald replies, I won't lose it. I'll put it right on the green. Donald takes a whack at it. And... Huey exclaims, third picture, bottom row, You've done it, Uncle Donald. It's right on the green. And... They walk toward the green that the ball is lying on. They have to cross over a little bridge. Next picture. Huey is carrying the golf clubs and the golf bag. And Huey says, But gee, Uncle Donald, you didn't lose a single ball. Suddenly, the shoulder strap breaks. And the golf clubs and the bag drop into the river below. And last picture. They both look at the golf bag lying at the bottom of the river. Donald scowls furiously. Oh, you rat. And Huey looks sad. And the golf clubs look. <laughs> oh, poor Huey. Just when it looked like he was going to get to go to the movies because Donald hadn't lost any of the balls. Yes, and now Donald has lost the whole set of clubs. Yes, but you know, he doesn't have to lose it. He's a duck. He can dive into the water and bring it up himself. Yes, let's hope they remember that. Now, now can we read Dagwood and Blondie, please? We certainly can, please, in just a second. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section, Dagwood and Blondie. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim Zam Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. Blondie's on the verge of a nervous breakdown. She's telling Tootsie Woodley, her friend... Oh, this is one of those days when everything seems to go wrong. I have to bake a cake for Mrs. McNuff's surprise party, and then I have to dye the living room drapes... And Tootsie and... Woodley tells her, Now, now, stop worrying, Blondie. We'll get everything under control. <laughs> An hour later, last picture, top row, Blondie goes to the kitchen, and Tootsie tells her, See how nicely everything's working out? There's your beautiful cake for Mrs. McNuff, finished to the icing. And Blondie exclaims, Wonderful. Now I'll fill the tub with hot water to dye the drapes. And she runs upstairs. She fills the tub full of water. And first picture, second row, just as she's going to put the dye in the water, Tootsie tells her it might be a good idea to look at her drapes before putting the dye in. Blondie says, Good idea. We'll run over to your house a minute. No sooner had they gone out of the house, though, than Dagwood comes home saying, Nice of the boss to let me go home early today. Maybe I can help Blondie around the house. He walks into the kitchen and sees the cake on the table. Last picture, second row. He cuts himself a piece, exclaiming, Oh, boy, what a delicious cake. Blondie knows how I love devil's food. <laughs> First picture, third row, he goes into the bathroom and sees the tub of water that Blondie has drawn to dye the curtains in. And he exclaims, And a tub of water all ready for me. Oh, man, what a beautiful wife I've got. And a moment later, he's in the bathtub soaking himself. So Suddenly, he hears I someone mean, coming up the stairs. Right. I love yours. And you can look really good, too. You know, I think I like my dress a little darker than yours. It's Tootsie and Blondie, and they stop outside the door. Dagwood exclaims, Oh, they're coming in here. And he takes a deep breath and ducks under the water. Tootsie and Blondie come into the bathroom, and Tootsie says, uh, We better use two packages if you want a darker. And she pours in a whole box of green dye. And Blondie says, You sure this isn't too much dye? But she pours in another box of green dye. Suddenly, first picture, bottom row, up comes Dagwood. <laughs> And he gasps, I, I can't hold my breath any longer. Dagwood, you're green. 
Tootsie dashes out of the bathroom with Blondie after her. They dash into the kitchen, and Tootsie exclaims, Oh, look! He's cut a big slice out of Mrs. McNuff's cake, and Blondie faints. Last picture is Tootsie fans Blondie trying to make her come to Dagwood wearing a towel and looking grief as an elf, walks in, and he reads the directions on a box of dye, and he howls, Oh, it says in the box here that the color is permanent. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the funniest thing you ever saw Dagwood be? Yes. Won't he look funny going into the office tomorrow? <laughs> I think that's the funniest thing. <laughs> Dagwood wearing that towel and looking green. Oh, when Blondie wakes up, she's going to faint again. <laughs> He's so funny. <laughs> well, I know one thing they can use him for. What? A traffic light. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> well, now... Oh, here's Roy Rogers right underneath Dagwood and Blondie. Read that, please. Very well. Since you're so eager, here we go. On the bottom of the page with Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip hi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip hi Deck Dolan has stolen a horse from Roy Rogers' ranch after trying unsuccessfully to kill Roy. Roy let out after Dolan. But no sooner had Roy left than Uncle Quincy, the timid bookkeeper, ran into his office and dressed up as the outlaw Killer Monty, saying that he'd show Roy he could do more than just push a pencil and do office work. First picture, Roy pursues Deck Dolan to an old mine. Dolan leaps off his horse and runs up an old oil chute up to the side of the mountain. When he reaches the top, he turns around so Roy can see him. Ah, if I can sucker Rogers up this old ore chute, I'll have him just where I want him. At this moment, Roy gallops up and reins in at the bottom of the chute. He sees Dolan at the top, running for a cave in the mountainside. Roy dismounts quickly, third picture, saying, All right, Now, easy, boy. Looks like the only way to reach Dolan is to climb that ore chute like Dolan did. Here I go. Dolan quickly grabs a barrel of kerosene standing nearby as he watches Roy coming up the chute, and he says, Ah, Rogers is coming. I ain't got a gun, but I'll bust every bone in his body with this. He rolls the barrel toward the head of the chute. And last picture, top row, pushes the barrel of kerosene down the chute. As it rolls, the cork pops out, and the kerosene pours onto the wooden chute. First picture, bottom row, it hits Roy, knocking him out. At that moment, Uncle Quincy, masquerading as Killer Monty, gallops up. He sees Deck Dolan at the top of the chute, touching a lighted torch to the kerosene, which catches on fire. The fire quickly races along the kerosene spilled on the wooden chute, travels swiftly toward the barrel and the unconscious Roy. Uncle Quincy, last picture, shouts, Hey, Roy, wake up! You're on fire! Oh, look! Roy is lying there subconscious and the fire is coming right to him. Yes, he's soaked with that kerosene. Who will you bring up? Unless Quincy saves him. Do you think he will? Well, we'll find that out next week. Oh, next week, next week. Oh, it's next week. The suspense is killing me. I know, but we'll still have to wait. My. Well, now if you'll go over the page, though. Oh, look, there's Flash Gordon. Yes, Flash Gordon, who has been sent out on an expedition to build a space platform in the air a thousand miles away from the Earth. But Ginger, uh, the scientist's niece, floated away. And Flash went after her to save her. And they were both captured by some tiny, ugly-looking men who came in an ugly-looking ship. Well, let's find out what happens to Flash and Ginger. So here we go with Flash Gordon. A rigga rigga doon doon saskimatash. Let's have music for heroic Flash. <laughs> Dr. Ruff climbs inside the rocket platform, circling the Earth. He tells Dale, We've lost Flash and Ginger. She was thrown off. Flash jumped after her. They vanished in space, and their oxygen won't last. Dale pleads for him to turn around and save Flash, but the scientist's face is grim second picture as he answers, No, Ginger is my niece, but to turn back would endanger more crew members. We can't do that. Meanwhile, last picture top row on the mysterious spaceship that has picked up Flash and Ginger, their captors reveal themselves as men from Mars. Their chief, Toxo, uses hypnotic brainwaves to make Flash answer questions about his unfinished space platform. Flash, who is in a trance and does not know what's happening to him, answers the questions, giving out the information to Toxo, leader of the Martians. First picture bottom row, Toxo focuses his periscope on the Earthman's project, and he gloats... I let the Earthmen build their platform, and then I'll capture it. 
Flash, slowly coming to, knows from Ginger's bitter charges of treachery that he must have given away secrets. Desperately, he tries to plan some way to outwit the Martians. The camouflage top of the Martian ship makes it invisible to the workers on the space platform who forge ahead in their building operations, unaware of the danger that lurks nearby last picture. The Martian observers keep a close watch, biding their time to strike at the great laboratory fortress floating thousands of miles above the Earth. Oh, I hope Flash thinks of some way to outsmart those Martians. So do I, because if he doesn't, the Martians are going to wait until the Earthmen have finished making that space platform, and then they're going to capture it themselves. Isn't it awful? Just think, they make themselves invisible, and they're almost right opposite the Earthmen, and the Earthmen don't even know that they're there. And just think, Flash is so close to Dale, and she doesn't know he's there. Oh, well, maybe next week he'll find a way to let her know. Oh, let's hope so. Well, now it's time for Dick's adventures. And look, here he is right across the page. I'm anxious to read that because, you remember, Dick is in the early days of America with Daniel Boone, who's a wonderful hunter. And you remember last week, Daniel Boone's son and some of the other early settlers were killed by the Indians in a cruel raid. Yes, and Daniel and Dick have left the settlement, and they're going out after the Indians. But I wonder why, because they're all alone, and the forest is full of Indians, and it's very dangerous. Well, let's find out now. Here we go with Dick's adventures. Say the magic words with me. riggedy pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. Despite constant bloody outbreaks, Daniel Boone is still intent on ending warfare between settlers and redmen in frontier Kentucky. With his own son killed, he and Dick trek ever deeper through the wilderness, seeking the Indian leaders. In a forest clearing, they suddenly halt. Dick and Daniel dismount and make their way quietly to the edge of the river. They peer through the tall grass and see across the swollen, reed-fringed stream the main Shawano village. Last picture top row, they see parties of warriors coming out of the woods and their horses. They're gathering for a war council and carry grisly trophies on their belts. Boone and Dick, knowing the Indians will listen only if no fear of them is shown, wade boldly cross, holding their hands high in the air in a gesture of friendship, first picture, second row. They climb out on the bank and are greeted by the chief who is frowning with hate, next picture. Boone demands a hearing before the assembled chiefs and braves, and quickly the word is passed around among the Indians. Last picture, second row, the warriors seat themselves in a large council hut. Admiring the white men's courage and risking themselves in their midst, the Shawanos hear out Boone in silence. He offers forgiveness for his son's death and then pleads for peace. First picture, bottom row, to Dick's joy, the warriors, after considering this proposal, offer to shake hands on it white man fashion. An instant later, Dick finds himself with a stalwart redman gripping each of his hands, and he sees that a similar ruse is being practiced on Boone. Both struggle furiously, but in vain, to shake their foes loose. And they're carried out of the council hut. Last picture, ambushed by these wily means, they are thrown roughly into a guarded hut. And there they wait till their fate is decided by the war council. Well, I think that was a mean trick. It was. When you realize that Boone came there without any hatred in his heart, even after the Indians had killed his own son and wanted to have peace, it was a mean, mean trick. Yes, and I think he was a wonderful man to be willing to forgive them for having killed his son. So do I. He realizes that hatred is no way to arrive at peace. No. I wonder what'll happen now. Well, after that trick, I'm afraid that Boone and Dick are in danger of their lives. Oh, I hope he escapes from that Indian camp. Well, we'll find that out next week. Now, look, underneath Dick's adventures, there's Rusty Riley. Oh, yes. And something mysterious was happening. You remember at uh, Rusty's farm, someone had been stealing oats from the feed bin, and they didn't know who it was? No. And then a little girl came to get laundry in her coaster wagon. And when she'd gone away, Rusty found some grains of oats where the wagon had been standing. And he wonders whether she could have been taking the oats. And that now he's trailed her into the woods. Well, let's read now and see whether she's the one who's been taking the feed. So here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Rusty sees Flip taking a little path leading off into a gully. He follows Flip, saying, 
That little girl, Queenie, must have gone down into this gully, but she sure couldn't pull that wagon with a basket of wash through this underbrush. Then suddenly he sees something through the bushes. He pushes them apart. And there's the wagon. He exclaims, Gee, Willikins, there it is, hidden in the bushes. He follows the path which leads down the hill. And at the bottom of the hill, he says, A cave entrance. Last picture, top row. Rusty looks at the ground in front of the cave entrance and says, Hey, she came in here all right. She spilled a few grains of oats. Hey, what the dick? Why, there's a print of a horse's hoof here. First picture, bottom row. Rusty goes into the cave quietly and finds Queenie there feeding a horse. Rusty says, well, Hello, Queenie. The little girl looks up very frightened. Rusty smiles at her and says, Don't you remember me, Queenie? I'm Rusty Raleigh from Milestone Farm. Queenie begs Rusty not to tell on her. Rusty sits down, third picture, and says, now, How about telling me all about it? I guess it's you who's been stealing the feed from our barn for this horse. Whose horse is she? Oh, come on, come on, tell me. So Queenie tells Rusty that it's her horse, Snowflake. Only she's not supposed to have a horse anymore. That they're too poor. Her daddy was going to sell Snowflake with the other horses when they lost their farm. But she hid Snowflake in the cave and pretended that the horse had strayed away. Rusty listens carefully to this sad story. And then last picture says thoughtfully and seriously... I know how you feel, but stealing is never right, Queenie. Say, maybe I've got an idea. Oh, I'll bet you Rusty will have a good, kind idea because he's a good, kind boy. I think you're right, and next week maybe we'll find out what the kind idea is. And I hope his kind idea will mean that Queenie can keep her horse and won't have to sell it. Oh, that'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes. Well, now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tommy Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with a little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man... The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.